I don't want anyone to go down this route ever again. I don't want this shit to ever happen for any student athlete uh, to not have a voice or to not ask questions, um, to not take the initiative, to not be able to speak up for yourself uh, by not asking all those questions. All right, Uli, thanks so much for joining me. Happy to finally get around to doing this, man. Appreciate you, Art. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so uh, you are a, an athletic trainer. You're like a movement mindset trainer. We also used to work together at Dealer Track, but uh, for listeners that might not be familiar with you, anything else you want to share? About everything? Or About anything? who you are. Um, well, one, we're bomb ass friends from Dealer Track. Yeah. And Dealer Track Cox Automotive Experience for me it was a little less than 10 years. We knew each other for five. Sound about right? Yeah, something like that. Is it? Yeah. Yeah, five. Um, but yeah, I would say that's. I, I don't know. I I don't know. But what like what do you do like with your uh, training and stuff? The training I do on a daily. The training is a development of the clientele that I have teammates. Shout out to my motherfucking teammates around here. Utah is one of the states that I have a few of them out here. So I came to watch games. I came to work on mindset preparation, went into their season. I work, or at least part of my target audience of teammates that I have are into sports that are into student athletes. And these are up and coming male, female, Student athletes from different areas, future prep is what I've been working on every single day. Uh, one example is these guys send me updates for my student athletes. They send me updates every morning before 9 a.m. And looking through those is just a checklist of assessments that we monitor, I monitor on a daily basis. Awesome. Uh, this all started, you're a student athlete, you're, you were uh, at university of new mexico right? yes uh so you played football any anything else i think it was just football right yeah i played football at university of new mexico state okay all right cool so like what was your experience in college uh, as a student athlete and like how did that affect what you wanted to do what you're doing now it impacted it heavy that was a heavy impact for me and very full of learned experiences throughout my four years of going there. It's between 2005 to 2009. Um, one of the, I guess for me is the target for student athletes and tying into my own experiences is that I had a really rough time transitioning from high school to college. And it was completely my responsibility. My ownership I take is as far as what I, what I should have done to prepare in order to be successful. And my experience in college was basically a lack of technical skills, being able to problem solve, being able to adapt or overcome any of the adversities that you would normally face in college. Uh, as a student athlete, definitely by far, even now at 37 years old, the hardest profession now at this point because of how um, colleges are getting paid. High school athletes are getting compensated from NIL deals. Uh, it's a huge, it's a huge thing right now. So I would even consider these guys professionals from the high school level. And it's gotten younger as far as the professionalism of student athletes. And that's a great thing. However, the adversities I faced in college in New Mexico State were from just going with the grain, being a, for me, just being a teammate and trying to uh, go along to get along. We've had, I went with a new coaching staff, Hal Mummy, and uh, his coaching staff that came on, I was with the first years, the freshmen, the incoming class of that year in 2005, coming from Koku High School in Hawaii. And uh, leading into that year, at least going before going to New Mexico State, it was always been a winning mindset. I went to three high schools from starting at 
St. Louis in freshman year and El Camino High School in Oceanside, California. Uh, my junior and senior year was at Koku High School and all winning programs. Uh, extremely, very strong-willed, very bought into the work ethic of being successful, which is in Psalm 1 terms, or at least just how I looked at it, being raised in Psalm 1 from Hawaii is. Uh, raising both and in California included, but it's a Kamafang Nwinga mindset. It's um, someone that's uh, extremely hardworking. That, that English version is translated to be um, workers at home. There's people that help out with around the house and they have roles and responsibilities in the Samoan culture. Everyone, everyone has a role, everyone has a place. So having structure in that sense of, I think, being in a winning environment of being pushed, being challenged, it's no easy task. The transition, though, was the lack of leadership and mentorship for me in college at New Mexico State. The lack of accountability of what coaches uh, would do with a handful of 18 year olds, what, 22 to 18 year olds, kids, 18 to 22, 18 to 23. So that's uh, my passion for training with student athletes now is long story short, or maybe a short version is that I don't want anyone to go down this route ever again. I don't want this shit to ever happen for any student athlete uh, to not have a voice or to not ask questions. Uh, to not take the initiative, to not be able to speak up for yourself uh, by not asking all those questions. I, I do come from a family of, um, there's five of us. I'm the youngest of five. And my, briefly, my parents have pushed five kids through academic and athletic scholarships. So the idea to have a plan of action going into it at a young age for myself um, was there. However, once you hand those reins over to someone else that's going to help watch you, lateral leadership, and be an extended version of your parents, then um, some of those questions, those red flags, I wish I would have known what to ask or see at a time. So I serve as a le leadership mentorship position in my own training program at Fono T-Way. And these are one of the things that we work on, or at least on a daily. Many, one of many is nutrition, the movements, recovery, um, the being a student of your athleticism is what I hope these other athletes in preparation for their, hopefully their journey of going through as a collegiate student athlete. Did you say high school students are getting paid now? Yeah, yes. How, how is that? It's lucrative. <laughs> Like, so just like the top athletes, is it like through their, their high school or is it, uh, what are they actually getting paid through? Is it like sponsorships that they're getting at, in high school? Yeah, there's the NIL deals, name, image, likeness. Mm. There are these sponsorship deals that are available for all athletes. Yeah. It's, uh, anyone, anyone can sponsor um, athletes in order to whether it's financial or any type of monetary value to it. So in this case, schools offer that as well as anyone that's in the area, any local businesses. It's, it's a great time. It's a yeah. bomb ass time to be a student athlete right now. When, uh, when did that start? The NIL deals? Yeah. Wow. Can't quote me, but within the last 10 years though. Okay. Yeah. Cause uh, for a long time, it seemed like college athletes, I didn't even think about high school athletes getting paid, but college athletes, like it seems like exploitation, what used to go on. Cause it's like, you're just devoting your life to the sport and uh, you can go to college and obviously only a certain percentage of college athletes make it to pros afterward. But you know, you bust your ass for a college team, you possibly get injured and you don't have a future in the sport or anything like that. But you gave like your blood, sweat and tears for that sport. And the college used to reap all the benefit from that. And 
while you might get a scholarship, uh, I would love for you to talk about this. Like when you're on a scholarship, uh, or when you went to college, like when you're on a scholarship, are you really encouraged to focus on school or is it mostly there for the sport? My own personal experience is when I did not graduate from New Mexico State. And I walked away with over 120 credits by the time I ended my four years. School is year round for student athletes. Yeah. At least what all of us did as a team, as everyone did, it was just unanimous to show up summer, year round summer, summer one and summer two on top of the fall and uh, both semesters, fall and spring semesters. So you go home for one or two weeks max before staying at school for the sake of training and staying actively engaged the whole time. So uh, personally, when I went through it, I wasn't doing well in those classes and through my advisor, at least from, again, just my own personal experience from mine was that uh, they still needed me to play. and. I ended up still playing and was jumping in a whole bunch of electives, taking on more electives. Damn near 120 of my credits, majority of them was electives. Mm. Shit don't work out. Yeah, so there, the focus really isn't on academics when you're on a scholarship for athletics? In your experience, obviously you can't speak for everyone. Personally, I was, uh, I mean, the resources are there. Yeah. The resources are in abundance. I can't, I can't just sit here and say that. Um, I'm I'm from Samoa, I'm from Hawaii. The resources are there. When I first saw a jug machine, when I first got there, uh, it's the this machine that shoots footballs, hmm. tennis balls, to work on your hand-eye coordination. Anyways, they got the jug machine over there. I'm like, what the fuck is this? What? Who's who? Who can use this? Who's able to use this? Oh, anybody. I was on there every every fucking day. Yeah. Hour before practice, hour before the workout, free to use these. So resources are there athletically. That we had, you had what you needed, and there was recovery. There was ice baths. Um, there was there was thing tools to get by, but uh, education wise, there was also that it's for me. I, there was no interest for school. I yeah. fucking I hated school. I hated it. I never had any interest of going into classes. Uh, and again, that was a product of just, for me, being completely real with it, is the lack of uh, comprehension skills to be a good note taker, or at least be an effective note taker. Uh, knew how to take notes, but I guess at the college level, the college experience, it, not I guess, but what I know is it's different. You have to do it at a faster pace. You have to do it in short terms. And I have to find things that work for you. I didn't fully understand my own comprehension skills at that point mm. to be successful in the, the school. Or I did not find interest in it as much as I worked on my athletic skills yeah. as far as the football program. Yeah. Um, do you feel like they encourage academics, though? Like they encourage school? Like they try to help you as much as they can. Yeah, I okay. think the it's, I think it's there. I think it's genuinely there. I, on top of that though, I also feel like it could have just been streamlined a lot better, way yeah. better. Yeah. For it to, um, not allow this situation to happen, because yeah. there's it was just so after you're done with four years, uh, at least for myself, I had to file appeal see if I could get the scholarship or get funded for it since you have five years uh, for that redshirt year as yeah. well. Yeah, so you didn't have a redshirt year? I did. Oh, you did? Yeah, I didn't redshirt when I got there. There's okay. a handful of us. There's a lot of freshmen that didn't redshirt to, for the sake of a win, now attitude, win, now mindset. For our coaches, the first year coaches. So I had a fifth year. I played all four years. But my senior year, 2009, was uh, I didn't have the grades. I still had over 120 credits, but what it came down was it wasn't towards anything for the Scott for my degree at the time was individualized studies. You 
work on three disciplines. Yeah. It's a football degree. It's, it's, uh, and I didn't have enough credits for those three disciplines. So at the end of it, they had told me I had to write a letter for an appeal. Uh, I appealed it. I wrote a letter. Uh, my appeal got denied. And the, that was it. They just said uh, if they needed my records, they can send that anywhere. But that was that was the rest of that. Uh, that was the end of that. So you get out of college and then, like, where are you standing after college? Like, because uh, you went into the Navy. Did you go into the Navy right away? Or was it kind of like not sure what to do for a little bit? And is that why you did, did the Navy? Because you just didn't have direction? Or what was that about? I went back to Samoa after I, after that situation and was helping out my parents with building uh, the house and just being able to, I believe, just figure out what was going on. What was the next step? The military for myself was always a passion of mine to join and something that I wanted to do right when I got what, my senior year in high school. I wanted to join the Navy, um, but the scholarship, or at least my family's push, was to go through the scholarship route, which I have no uh, completely solid plan to, mm. as far as making it through uh, free education. So another opportunity, but anyways, I've always had a passion to join the military, join the Navy, join, join the Army. I'll say that the Army at the time, but... Um, Fast forward to 2010, 2011, it was more thinking about joining the Navy at that point through the people that I met and influences. Um, yeah, so that was about five years of me being in the Navy between the reserve and serving active duty time. Uh, between the Navy and college, which do you feel prepared you for life after more? College or or the Navy, the Navy, Navy. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, well, combination of both. The student athlete shit is, again, I say it's, it's the hardest thing that I've done hmm. because of the balance of student, the academic side of it, as well as the athletic side. You, the schedule is year round the same, pretty much the same. Five waking up at four thirty five, being out there to run by five five thirty being prepped to run 15. Again, it's, you get done with your run, you have a scheduled lift after, maybe in, in between class, maybe after class, maybe later on that afternoon. You have, I was in A-plus Aggies, which is the, the extra tutoring sessions that they had after for two, three hours mm. that you, I was, I was in every day. Yeah. I was in every day. You have to meet criteria to it. So the resources there, it's, Again, there's no interest, looking back in hindsight, there's not going to be anything, anything else as far as anything. It's always going to be less than max fucking effort. Yeah. Uh, do you, how, so when you work with athletes now, uh, what are you mostly working on them with? Because you work uh, with people in middle school, high school, and college, right? Yeah. So what are... What are the things that you work with for each level? Like, so middle school is, is your training much different between those different levels or is it pretty consistent? I mean, there's got to be different things you work on with each, right? With the differences is the connecting the dots for the movements of their sport mm. or a quarterback different, going to continue to work on more rotational movements working on transverse lines from all different levels, different planes um, versus uh, a volleyball player who's someone like just last night working with one of my volleyball players, Queen, is the change of directions and being able to make quicker decision-making by improving hand-eye coordination of live reps. We've done the work of change of direction. We've done the work of the speed, microdosing speed, throughout the last couple of years. But now connecting the dots, that's going to differentiate between athletes, between sports, between age groups, um, understanding those concepts of where they're at, their comprehension levels of 
how much can they understand and take on that's that varies but what i ended up doing over the last two years specifically is i've been using competition as a universal as our universal cultural identity mm. and whether i have athletes that are six or seven years old going against high school athletes 17 going, going college athletes I don't give a rat. I'm combining all of them together because competition builds and the trickle down effect is fucking amazing because yeah. when you catch them at a younger age of finding someone that's interested, finding someone that's interested in competition, that's wanting to improve on a daily and you can ignite that sense of urgency at an earlier age, it goes a long way as far as them starting to build daily habits, build tendencies for success, I believe. Yeah. What are the, uh, what are the features of somebody who sticks with it versus somebody who kind of drops out of the program with you? Like, I'm, I'm sure you've had some people not stick with it, right? Yeah. So like, we're, what are the d distinguishing features that uh, tell you, or, or do you know, do you know ahead of time someone's going to stick with it or not? Like, I, I would love to hear, what you see as a coach. Hell yeah, I see that shit. When they stop doing daily goals, all athletes, like I mentioned earlier, they send me their updates. When they stop sending that on time, those are tells those are signs already. Mm. When they start when they stop being a hundred percent committed, they'll start have chinks in their armor as they're going about things. And that's why if for the way that I have my, at least my process of training is I set this up with basics of goal settings, simplifying them strictly to daily movements, daily nutrition, daily habits. And instead of this being a point and click, some type of PowerPoint of this is meal preps, one, two, three, four, five, you do this. This is more free flowing of commitment though. The commitment is, should be unwavering, should be no question. So uh, as far as uh, what I see, I have assessments that they fill out on a daily to, for me to check. And if they're not meeting those standards that I know, I believe works extremely well, then they're out. They fuck it, they gotta go. Is there a, uh... Is there a remedy for it? Like if you see somebody who's like falling off, can you write the ship or is it just a sign that they're done? Uh, the opportunity is I'm going to tell you my truth of what I think. And based off of what you hear, if you still want to continue to work out and do it, as long as you know where I'm coming from, yeah, we can continue to run and work out, but you're wasting money at this time. Mm. You're wasting my time at this point. So, for example, is I had a, I have a bomb ass family of athletes coming to me for a minute. And everyone was bought into it. Little by little, more people want to do it. Great family affair. The athletes that I'm talking about are athletes that look like me, minorities, and built like me and have natural tendencies of athleticism is what I call it. Now, genetics, speed, and genetics, being in genetics is a myth being debunked currently by the ways that myself and I believe others are training. By you, challenging you say the genetics of athletics is a myth? Speed, speed being a genetic. Oh, gotcha, okay. Okay. Cause that, yeah, there's definitely a genetic po component to athleticism. Like some people mm -hmm. are definitely yeah, more athletic, of um, but speed, like you can just train speed. You like, so if somebody's speed. slow, an athlete, cause like a well, small people t tend to be bigger people. Right. So, um, uh, and hopefully I'm not saying anything wrong, but like Samoan people tend to like, if they're not in shape, they tend to like get a little heavy. Right. Yeah. Like weight problems and stuff like it's a that. a nice way to say that art. Okay. So, so like, 
you're saying if you have a Samoan athlete in front of you and they're they're athletic but they're just slow, you can train them to be fast. It's a hundred percent true. Yes. Huh. Interesting. How do you do that? Yes, as a speed coach for Universal Speed Rating, it is a program that is the blueprint, the the mastermind behind this, the speed fucking scientist, Les Spellman, is one of a few who is teaching speed mechanics. That is very, very influential for it as far as in my experience of doing it for the last three years. It's, I'm a universal speed lab in Washington area. And because I have my ties to other states, I travel to Hawaii, Utah, California, and Pennsylvania, continue to New York, continue to travel to these states. I take with me this education to teach speed. I come with this knowledge of what I truly believe is a component that is needed across all sports, mm. across all human beings. And because I have a, a bomb ass set of teammates, some of them are not athletes. Some of them are health and wellness. Some of them are performance maintenance. That's, that means my athletes who are fitness connoisseurs, former athletes who are fitness connoisseurs, and like to complete, compete against my athletes. Mm. These speed is fucking universal for athleticism. It's needed. It has to be for us, for our program, for my program, Phono T Way, it's prioritized one. That is one A and a few others follow after that, one A, one B, one C, but speed through balance, through rhythm and timing, through cadence. And that's how I'm going about this as far as challenging the central nervous system fire. And coupled with the knowledge empowered by universal speed writing, we trying to kill motherfuckers, at least with speed. So just like how you mentioned someone, someone like myself, 6'3", 6'4", 6'3", 280, 290, can continue to run and break these barriers um, of four, six, four, five, four, four, whatever it is, is a 40 time. Mm. Improve these, these speeds that are unheard of for a culture of minds, as well as Polynesian people. What the fuck is gonna happen when this shit hits and everyone's running like this? Yeah. It's, and what's great about USR, Universal Speed Rating, is for me, once I learned this shit three years ago, I'm like, God damn, we did not fucking train like this at New Mexico State or Kohu or St. Louis or El Camino or in Samoa or any other fucking place. Everywhere I've been, we've never learned speed this way. Mm. And it made sense. Unfucking real. So, my personal experience tied to it again, another bittersweet memory now is I have a chance to share this shit. I have a chance to chase this passion of helping others not make my same mistakes. One of them is being more efficient. One of the things that we've done at every school I mention is we condition like the hell. 2110s or some shit like that. 2220s. X amount of 300 mile timed. We ran all these shit. And in learning these ways, similar to a Les Spellman, Tony Holler, Bomb Ass, people that I'm mentioning, these are speed scientists, in my opinion, that have just made it simplified the game to make it learnable for everyone and touch other people. Tony Holler is from East Coast. And Les Spellman, I think he's from Cali. My bad, Les. My bad, Les. I don't think he's from Cali, but he's, they're, they're touching lives. And especially for myself, I think uh, maybe the first, maybe first of many, second of many, first of many of someone, trainers um, who want to learn speed the right way and 
want to build with communities that give a fuck about you. That's the careness, the leadership, the mentorship. It's from a teammate perspective. I'm fucking with it everywhere. So with this, uh, it, it's pretty cool. It sounds really cool. Like, I mean, you, you have bigger athletes and often like historically people thought like a big athlete could be powerful, but not fast. You know, like you can have a lot of power behind uh, your movements, but maybe not speed. Speed's not your thing. Uh, so it's kind of like flipping that up on its head. Um, do you feel like, I mean, you said you were at all these different places and they didn't train like this. Do you feel like most of the trainers out there, most of the coaches out there are just going with what they've been taught rather than looking for new information? Like, do you think that's what like sets you apart and sets these uh, trainers that you look up to apart is that they're, they're just constantly looking for the new information? Yes. I'm building with Les Spellman, with Tony Holler, with these guys at Universal Speed Rating Lab because I believe in the same principles that they have. And I have a similar, for myself and my teammates, it's a teammate first mentality, is to build each other up and competing against each other. Yes to what you mentioned is, is it currently, is it still common, I think, if, if I, let me understand that correctly, is it still common in, with other coaches? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, like, so with, with other coaches is a lot of what they're doing is just going with what they've learned in the past. So they're just, I feel like this as a, I guess, former athlete, but I just was an athlete in high school. But when I train, I'm usually training just what I learned 30 years ago, 20 years ago. It's not... I guess 20 years ago is more accurate. I'm not constantly updating, but it's, it's also not my field, right? But I'm not updating the information constantly. I'm not like up on the new research, up on the new techniques and stuff like that. Um, I would hope that coaches and trainers are a little bit more, but I would say even that, from my experience with coaches, a lot of them are just training how they were trained. So are they mostly just not updating their information? From my current and previous experience of the last 14 years of training, it has been the same going through the motions of movements. So to some degree, yes, uh, a, a lot of schools in Washington um, area, in Hawaii area, in Utah area, California, definitely is ahead of it, the game. And so are these other bigger states, Florida, Georgia. These schools are developing speed um, due to, to really great technique. And it's due to a, a lot of components. One of them is the competition level is extremely fucking high at those states. And that's, that's bomb. It's bomb to play in those states because that's where you're always going to face good competition. Myself, personally, I, I would want that every day. I would want to play someone great every time where even if it's not teachings, is to compete the whole time. But with speed, the I what I'm seeing is that the current trainers and coaches and teaching these if there's the same foundation that they had when like i had coming up as a former athlete during the time that i played um, new mexico state and down it's it's the same thing it's let's gas these guys out let's run them condition them after practice if practice is three hours you condition your athletes for the last half an hour 20 minutes of nonstop gassers or 10 gas or five, it's, it's too much. Mm. What works is microdoses of speed. What works is, is grabbing peak velocity reps and being able to get efficiency through quality versus quantity. It's not about the numbers game, which due to I would say just, again, just looking back in hindsight and looking at it now, 
it's still monkey see monkey like it, we're good we're, we see that this team does 10 sprints we're gonna do 12. oh what they're doing 12 let's do 14. team a team b keeps adding up stacking oh we do 20 one tens we do 30 one tens i think that also adds to these layers of not doing your research and not doing your due diligence of searching or researching to improve speed that's what pisses me off is that that lack of interest i'm over here fucking 30 hot that i'm finding this shit three years ago yeah and as soon as i found out i'm like wow this is amazing it's gonna help improve me and my athletes but what the fuck trainers coaches why just go with the norm i just think that that's it yes social media helps to find um any type of influences or anything that you're looking for especially with the algorithm it will help you find anything back then a lot harder 20 years ago however networking finding people asking questions taking the initiative having a voice those things weren't there for my coaches or maybe even if it was um it wasn't in a way that it uh it maximized or fully maximized my athletic potential do you feel like uh part of it is like a college coach doesn't want to give help to another college coach that they might compete against, right? Like, do you feel like there's any of that? Like where, where people just don't want to help somebody that might end up, that is competition or might be competition one day? Yeah. Yeah. I, that's, that's a possibility. Um, again, my own opinion on that is I train these guys currently. I kick their ass in our workouts every fucking session. I spare no energy. I'm not reserved. There's nothing in reserve by the time I get done with these sessions because I go 100%. And whether they're six, seven, nine, 12 years old, 15 years old, 29 years old, 21, it don't matter. I don't give a fuck because my culture of training, my program is built on competition mm. and is built on it being you versus me in every single rep throughout the whole time that we stay together. I, and the reason why I'm going about it this way, as far as it being challenging every single day, because when I, again, when I look back at my potential, when I look back at my guy given talents, physical talents, it's wasted. My mouth pay me, my mouth whoop it. Waste of time, waste of money. Mm. I've said that to a few athletes over the past year and telling them that we got hey, we gotta we gotta part ways. You not we not moving the same way. Mm. I want it more than you do, that's a problem. Yeah. Your parents want it more than you do, that's a problem. Others want it more than you do, and you still by here, you still lazy. That's a fucking problem. So you either shape the fuck up, come correct. Be an effective communicator through active accountability, or you got to hit the road. So when it when it comes to feedback, you don't uh, you don't pull your punches too much. Fuck that for what? <laughs> for what? <laughs> yeah. It's a waste of time. Yeah. It's a, it's my business. I want to win now, and I want to win efficiently. So competition to go back to your questions. Yeah, at, trainers and coaches could feel that way. Like, yeah, there's the secrets with speed, though. You want your athletes to go against them. You want to, the way I'm going about it is I want to teach these guys how to beat me, how to do it efficiently with the least amount of wasted movements. And if we do it this effectively over and over again, your one day, your progress checkpoint is beating me at some point. I'm just going to make it extremely fucking hard until then. Yeah, I see you. Uh, I see videos occasionally, and I see you like you're doing all the same movements that your athletes are doing. Like I see you. Obviously, you you featured the athletes doing the movements as well, but I see you regularly doing the exact same exercises. So, like, what is your philosophy on that as far as being able to do the same thing as your athletes? And 
How does that look as you grow older? Like, do you see yourself doing this? Like when you're 50, obviously you still be training, but maybe you'll be a bit slower. Like, does that not matter? It's about just doing it. I, again, I have, I, I had a solid ass support team, solid ass lateral leadership in high school that were outside of my parents. I'm grateful to a bomb ass community, all three communities that I mentioned from St. Louis, which is in Honolulu, Hawaii, to El Camino High in Oceanside, and even to Kohuku in Laie in Haula, I lived in Haula. I had a bomb ass coach in Coach Cala, Santiago, fucking Maine. This guy was, could do all the movements, everything he taught us, or he was a DB's coach, but he ended up being my track and field coach with a different position, but he ended up being my track and field coach and would teach us how to hurdle. And just one scrappy Hawaiian, scrappy Kanax is this guy that was just showing you, okay, you're going to jump this way, you're going to, you, you fuckers are going to hop over this like this. You're asking for visual reps. Uh, just shows, shows us exactly how to do it. None of us could do it at the time. Mm. Same way. Being able to skim that low over hurdle, which was, again, his attention to detail on explaining it and showing it completely, it helped me learn. It was like, oh shit, that was, these are great, great sessions, great practice sessions. I model it after him as well as other people that I've come in contact with, uh, other trainers, other attributes that they've had. And my favorite is trainers that can do the shit, Mm. trainers that can move. I met another bomb ass trainer, Danny Arnold, at Plex Athletes, athletic, uh, Plex Athlete in Sugarland, Texas. My junior year when I was prepping for the combine for my senior year. You know, went out there for a month, went out, bomb ass opportunity with my brother, Tony, to go out there and see how athletes train in preparation for the combine. He was doing the movements. Motherfucker was on, it was just doing them. And they were not easy functional pattern movements that I got to experience. I learn extremely well when someone shows me visual reps. I learn extremely well when they show it to me live. I will learn extremely well when their understanding of verbal comprehension and as well as oral and written, they had a whole game plan. It blew my fucking mind when I went out there. Mm. The attention to detail was nuts. The recovery, the movement, the schedules. So on top of all that is when I see trainers and coaches that can do it, like Coach Beattie and again from Goku, they, it, that's, I model my game after that um, of being actively engaged. I'm a one man team for now. And I want to run this shit the way I want to do it. And that has to be with trainers that want to fucking train and compete. So Universal Speed Rating Lab, I want to continue to just tie this all back in, is built on this same same value, same disciplines. Mm. Built through competition. It's not about what well, we have. I have the USR Speed Lab. There's another speed lab that's right down the street from me, Athletic Forum, that's less than 10 minutes away. I've reached out multiple times to collaborate a little slow to collaborate. Yeah. I get it though. But I'm not like that. I don't give a fuck about that. I want to collaborate. I want to win together. Especially if we know this knowledge. It's time to give this shit back and empower athletes that want to do this. Especially ones that, again, I, I was never, whatever you see on social media, that was not me in high school. Mm. I was, it, balance, stability can be taught and elite balance and optimal stability and both uh, pairing those together is applicable in every sport. Yeah. And being able to learn that and over the last um, 2011 is when I got certified in sports science lab and being able to train foot ankle mobility. Since then it's been the biggest difference. All of all the shit I learned after college, my new so. What the fuck? But it's bittersweet. It's got given. 
why does that matter so much? Like, so yeah, I see you training, uh, like ankle support, like ankle balance and uh, stability and stuff like that. Obviously there's the injury component. You don't want to get injured, but as far as like, let's say you're training a basketball player who wants to dunk and, and can't right now need to have a higher vertical. How much does that balance aspect play into, uh, things that we normally associate with power and, uh, power and yeah, I guess power, like how much does that balance, uh, training factor into things we normally associate with power? Everything is associated with power. It is what is touching the ground in every single way. And to be specific, not just the whole foot, but the forefoot. Foot's divided into three sections, the forefoot, the midfoot, and the hind foot. And that forefoot is constantly engaged with the ground. So it makes even more sense to work on challenging the central nervous system to fire at faster rates than thoughts can be processed. And if you remove the thought process from it and you just have athletes that just instinctively move, it changes everything. Mm. Then you're no longer, your, your movement is always gonna be with intention. Your movement is, there's not gonna be a delay in it. Your reactive time is going to be on on point it's always going to be there it's it's because your reactiveness is just as if you're the fast twitch muscles that we work on is stimulated not fried so training proprioception specifically in the ankle and working that foundation from building from the foot up in that aspect is working on all muscle hinge groups in that same form working at different planes of those muscle hinge groups. So that's where I focus all my, a primary of my attention at is building athletes from every single one, bomb ass professional athlete that I worked with earlier this year, Jeremiah Masoli. Shout out to those, so Jeremiah. He's had two season ending injuries over the last two years. And we had a 14 week program dropped 45, 40 plus weight pounds and extreme, extreme work ethic that I fucking love. And the only way to challenge the fascia is with this type of mindset mm. of being able to give max fucking effort with your, again, with joints when tendons are involved in order to create this lattice work across your tendons. It has, it requires you to give max effort in bursts, in short bursts. And we mimic them to be for each sport. And one of these was for, in Jeremiah's case. And this camp was to mimic the same way that football players go through plays, how long that lasts, the break in between, and shortening that, that tempo to be a lot more condensed. So it's even improved. So when he transitions to being back on the field, it's, more learned experience already gained before even hitting the field. The foot downloads all of that. Mm. The ankle downloads all of those. And if I'm able to get athletes and put them at different angles, at different positions, uh, especially change of direction shit, especially break in, you have to protect that first. It has to be a prehab mentality with training athletes in my program, in my opinion, because the feet are your money makers. Mm. There's no one playing on the goddamn hands. Like, it has to be with your feet. It has to be you being able to explode and being able to transition from one to the other in rhythmic pattern in a tempo that's real similar to a one two beat. Yeah. So, that's why the foot to me is the yeah, most important. I, I start off with that in. I use that as my first form of evaluating if this is good. Again, if that's physically, how much work is going to be put in there? Are they a developing athlete, a evolving athlete? Are they one that's further from the spectrum? 
as far as being able to learn even it, everything is there's no balance there's completely no stability there's no cognitive responses to time and be in rhythm same arm same leg when they run all that goes into play of where i place the map but what doesn't matter is the competition that's that's first and foremost so the three disciplines that i carry and make sure that every team in my nose is having a sense of urgency in everything we do being able to lock the fuck in and focus the whole time mm. and giving max fucking effort giving effort is it, these three things can never be questioned or else that's a red flag in my program mm. there you are you you gotta go because it only takes one where do you get your work ethic from? Because I've always admired your work ethic. I think you're one of the hardest working people I've ever met. And uh, I'm just amazed when I see you like just constantly going at it. Where do you get your work ethic from? Like you've been multiple different countries. You've been in multiple states, been all over. Have you always had that? Did you develop it somewhere? Where'd you get it? It's from my dad. <laughs> It's from my parents. It's from, again, lateral leadership. I, all the, the people that I just mentioned, as well as my parents, it's extended, they're extended hands of the, I, I would think the brain of the operation, which is my parents. And my dad was a carpenter and was someone, again, someone values Someone believes is not to waste time. I've learned at a really extremely young age through uh, disciplines that shape me to have better habits, mm. are disciplines that improved my characteristic traits, I believe. And one of them is, like you mentioned, is having a work ethic to just to give max effort when i say that as a, the examples is after college you asked where did i go i went to went back to samoa and that to help out and build what i did earlier on before high school i lived in samoa for a couple of years in kafunga and autoville and american samoa and tutuila i help my parents every day on building our house. And that's what my parents did is that they would flip houses and we would live in them, live in them and we would build them ourselves. Mm. I was a help, free help over here. <laughs> and again, applying someone behavior, someone tendencies is as soon as the sun comes up, there's you're working it's already planned to work and we would work when we do construction or we did anything on the house making a staircase building doing a drywall fixing the roof when we did the staircase and building staircase we started at five in the morning before the sun we got we had breakfast at five be out by five thirty. dad's putting his bandana on getting ready for work and playing music in his game time. And he has a switch that he just went into that I just, well, one, I just, you just have to follow along. My brothers, my sisters weren't there when I lived in Samoa, and it was just me and my dad most of the time. My mom was out helping out with my brothers, with helping out with my sister at least. My brother, Tony, my older brother, was in University of Nebraska at the time and needed help as a student athlete. Mm. So having that relationship with my dad and seeing that work ethic for two years living in Samoa, uh, I did construction with him before, but that shit was, yeah, that shit was, it was, it was a lot. And it was great because it, he was showing me one thing and expect that I'd learn it in one time. First time I learned it, I never learned it on the first try. It ended up being seven, eight times. Um, and then eventually it got down to being one time that he would show me. Then I would move on and start me hitting a, hitting a nail with a hammer, hitting it straight on so it doesn't turn. Me being able to 
be aware of the studs and not walk and it just things like that's a normal carpentry 101 i believe knowing the different sizes of nails being able to engage did i want to do that shit hell nah the fuck i wanted to go play football and play basketball like everybody else was but that work ethic to come home go to school uh i'd have to do my if i was my chores in the morning so getting up at 4 30 again once the school started get up cut the grass big ass grass big ass lawn um do that for an hour go back get ready for school then at school come back come right back into doing construction for the next seven eight hours before we shut it down getting back at two doing that till eight or nine and and then shower eat sleep go to bed do it again the next morning for mm. two years to be uh again hardly any time to chill hang out with friends my friends every time or at least the friends i had lala lala gang baby is that they would come over and they, they would help work. They would start playing. <laughs> they come like, hey, Lola, can we hang out or what? Like, fuck it, can you guys, can you guys come in and help me put these studs out real quick for us, please? Can you do, you help me uh, clean this up? It was, it was a youth of, of work for me. And my parents showed me do their hard work. That's the work ethic that I had uh, going into high school and going into athletics. And again, going into Dillatrack, um, I appreciate you for saying that, Art. I really do, because getting that job and working with you, I felt out of my league when I first got promoted to senior implementation specialist with you. And wait, wait we, you were there first. You was there, I can't remember I can't exactly, remember. but you went in the class before me, but all the responsibilities that you would have at dealer track the departments the service the sales the parts the accounting it's it's, it's a big it's a task a big ass task to manage so that work ethic taught me at least in every other dealing that i've had even going to military and going to dealer track that it, it don't matter what the fuck anybody knows my dad who had no degree, he did not finish elementary, and he made it by purely hard work. And his dad did something real similar to him is that his dad had taught him how to be a carpenter. Um, some a father that wasn't in his life and had taught him how to be a carpenter by working with him. Immediately, meaning he went to night school with him as well and he showed up when he needed to get the hours and if he got registered he got a he earned his certificate to be a carpenter with my grandfather and work as a wise to me those kind of stories you, you can't shake that shit you can't ever forget that yeah yeah it seems I, I value education as far as school is concerned, but I actually value uh, I value desire more than I value like what somebody's done. Like when it comes to somebody taking a job or anything like that, it's like you can only get so far off of uh, talent. Like talent doesn't really take you too far. It seems like your your passion, your desire to progress, gets you further. Like it, that's what really matters in life. Granted, like there's some professions where a degree matters. Like you don't want, you don't want uh, somebody without a degree building a bridge or something, you know, you don't, you don't want somebody who hasn't done the, the steps to get to that level uh, for like an engineer, uh, a doctor, certain things like that. But for the most part, I like it where we're, we're moving as a society, as a world where we're, I think we're understanding more that it's more about, what you're willing to put into it rather than like what you've what background you have what uh talent you have things like that i agree it's it's i i think coupled with that though is having interest in whatever your passion is yeah. whatever it is that you find and i always loved working out 
I've always loved working out. Um, every family that I went to or stayed with in the three schools that I went to, I've always highly recommended to all my family members to work out in Oceanside. All my family members, my first cousins, they always show out every time I came. And what was great was working out was something that they were not familiar with at the time, but they were willing to do. They would go on walks with me. They would just entertain the idea of fitness. I mean, outside of love and complete uh, family love, but fitness, I always had an interest in school. I tried taking a class the way it was taught to me when I was going through kinesiology, I was like, what the f I don't want to do this. It was set weights. It was set, set lifting protocols. And again, similar to my understanding of my comprehension skills, the teacher that was teaching, the professor that was professing, he wasn't showing us how to do it. He was putting on a PowerPoint and trying to tell us how to do this lift. Instead of teaching us, I lost interest immediately. Mm. Like, yeah, no, nah, I'm not. This, that's, yeah, training's not for me. I don't want to be a trainer. Like that. But how it's presented and how it should be, I guess, in a good way, provoked in order to be challenged in that sense is that's how I gauge these student athletes. That's how I gauge all athletes. If you're not 100% committed, you should go to the recreational center and go work out over there. Mm. You shouldn't pay for this service. I'm just keeping it real. I would, as a parent, I would not be paying for some shit that my, my kid is not giving a hundred percent. You wanted this, well, go run outside for the first month to see if you really want this or not. Let's see what you're doing to do. What are you going to do first? What, what sacrifice are you going to make? before we start to pay for your trainings and it adds up so these type of things it matters as far as the development of it it can it can be stimulated it can be cultivated it can be it can be brought out it could be taught it's it's also it's yes and yes yes and yes and yes it's if you are not interested in a way of well, interested is a vague word, well, how about type, if you're not obsessed with this passion, if you're not obsessed with your passion as far as interested in it, you're not going to be you're not going to be willing to sacrifice sleep, sacrifice time from family, sacrifice the things that really matter the time you can't get back so money situation of that is when i'm telling these athletes and i'm letting these guys go is one your parents already came out of pocket for you the way i run it i prefer it to be up front so they also make a sacrifice they trust the process by seeing what my value is and exchanging business in that sense they're making that sacrifice to say, okay, well, can we do this? No, let's pay it this way from here because I'm worth it. This value of building technical skills is worth it. So the training side of it, if they're interested in their sport, they just have to be interested first, then yes. If they're not interested, then it's a hell no. It's going to be pulling teeth the whole time. And that's what, that's the last thing you want in any training program is to have athletes show up just woke up from a nap, sluggish, slowly walking in, you know, just those are all body mannerisms. Someone that's not interested right now, someone that's tired, someone that's just waking up. I have athletes that pull up, they're texting me an hour in advance because they know how I want it to be. They know how I'm uniform. Most athletes are like this. Mm. They text me ahead of time. They text me about an hour in advance. Teammate. I'm about to be 10 minutes late and they still show up one or two minutes just uh, just just in case. And I've already told these, but we've already used that example. We've had learning experiences that's gotten us through that. But that's the type of teammates, that's the type of athletes I have now is accountable ones, ones that are pulling up. And if they're late or if they're coming up on time, if anyone that's late, they're running up. 
if they're not running up, I'm checking them as soon as they have like, what? What type of sense of urgency do you have? You don't want to get better as you don't want to get better as much as I want you to get better. Mm. We gotta get the work in. You have X amount of time. We have to work. You paid for an hour session. I am going to maximize my time. If you're my last session, I'll go for 90 minutes. I'll go for two hours. I don't give a fuck. Because if you say you show me that you're starving for it and you want to succeed as bad as my work ethic is showing to want you to succeed, once we align goals, it's game time. Mm. That means I'm all the way in. Once we exchange money, once we exchange business services, once we finalize this engagement contract to work together, do parents, once they've done that, that's their responsibility. It's completely on the student athlete after that point. It's completely on the athlete because I run it like they're professional athlete. When you're uh when you're training, yeah, you work with all these different sports. Do you do you find that you prefer working with certain athletes like in certain sports, or is it pretty broad for you? Like is it just is it more of the mindset that you're after, more of like a certain temperament and a personality style, like uh, somebody who's dedicated to their sport doesn't matter the sport. I, I part of my target audience is minorities, mm. people that look like me, because again, I didn't have a me when I was oh. coming up. Although I had brothers that made it and sisters that have gone through the college route, their experience is not mine. And my experience is not theirs. I'm the, it, it's, I have been in search of training other minorities and other Polynesians and black and Puerto Rican. I want them all. I want all of them. But what it's evolved into due to a lot of things, a few things, a lot of things is the people that have gravitated towards this training are the ones I'm working with. Mm. The people that want active accountability, the people that don't mind me speaking my mind and telling them the truth of how I see it, the people that want to be effective communicators and be direct and not always text and email, but actually have full conversations. Those are the people that I'm working with. And it's the energy I'm hopefully continuing to put out because those are the only people I want to work with. The minority kind of went out the door because due to bad business, due to challenging businesses, due to uh, IOUs, due to that uh, discounted conversations, uh, at least in a compromise of value conversations. That's a normal mindset that I've faced in previous times, including my family, as far as what I understand. One, it's applicable to those. I'm rocking with those who, are, if they're seeing long term, it's always a compromise because I want to just want, I want to keep on keeping this a referral based program. That way I work on the development side. That's my passion. Mm. So I am not biased to anyone. I'm gearing up to run it with a couple of teams, Washington Baseball Academy out in Seattle. And very extremely grateful for that opportunity to see come to fruition because of the owners who have like-minded uh, tendencies, like-minded um, goals to help our community, minorities, and even people that look like they want to have an extreme work ethic. That's people that look like me as well. They want to come and build through disciplines of hard fucking work. Come, come with, come with it. But it's, yeah, it is um, definitely a standard that I don't want to sacrifice at all, and I want to continue to keep at a high level because I've seen it work on so many levels, professional and down. It is uh, highly effective because it's. It's effective communication, active accountability. You mentioned discounts, and I find the concept of discounts when you're running a business and uh, 
like I think it's applicable to a lot of different areas. Like you, you want to, you're offering a service and you think it can help somebody. So you, you look at them and say, okay, you're not like on board yet, but if I give you this discount, maybe I can get you on board. And it, it seems like that tends to not work out. Uh, and maybe it's because of their commitment isn't there. Like, because they just don't have to invest as much into it. Uh, they don't have to go at the, the regular pricing or whatever. What's your experience with discounts? Like, do discounts generally result, like, do people who you give a discount to try to get them on board, do they have a lower success rate than people that pay full price? No, that varies. Mm. Just varies on... I guess it depends why you're giving them a discount. Too. Yeah, the I have again, I have solid teammates who's with me at a compromised rate. Mm. I'm okay with it. Yeah, because we spoke about it and it's expressed as far as a concern of the value of it. But the commitment level is, man, we we with you. We with you. We don't matter what gym you go to. It don't matter what gym you go to. Mm. We're with you. I'll take the loyalty with the compromise price any day, as long as, again, circles back always is effective communicating through active accountability. That's it. How's your, how has your business model, uh, cause you've been doing this like three years, is that right? Yeah. How's your business, business model and mindset about operating it as a business changed over those three years? Four years, geez, we're getting ready. But it's changed. It's changed. It's definitely matured me in the business side of it. It definitely helped me separate my emotions from my business decisions so I can make more sound judgments, so more better decision-making, more improved decision-making, that's never going to be feelings-based. That's That's been the biggest growth uh, as far as business-minded from year one to year now is the maturity of separating emotions from decision-makings when faced with adverse decision-makings, adverse experiences. For example, um, Two years ago, I was living out here and I was out here for three months and we had, we had, you, we had, you see me at that time, but two years ago I was out here and I was a living trainer for a family friend, best friend at the time. And I served, my responsibilities was a trainer, movement trainer, uh, worked on the nutrition side of it, worked on the recovery side of it, worked on connecting the dots. Again, the movement of being proved. And this was for my nephew. And again, long story short, that was three months of work, of everyday grind. And what ended up being was I didn't get paid for it. Got a little drip drop of money, maybe less than 2000 to rack. And that's a business killer in any situation, in any workforce, no matter who it is, no matter what business. Um, I had to eat that shit and I had to have standards in place reinforced standards in place. And one of them was not allowing to always compromise my prices at first. Again, before then I was always leading Well, I charge this, but if you can't afford it, you know, we can work something out. That was how my words were coming. Now it's, this is my prices. This is where we're at. The compromises, what can we do? What, what are we, how long do you see this going for? One, one month, two months. If it's one or two, it's not worth it. If 
it's three months or more, it's worth it. You'll get, you'll get a good return on it based off of balance, stability, ankle foot mobility, strengthening all muscle hinge groups, the mental preparation of downloading technical skills and learning these communication skills needed. Um, those are the, my pitches now. And it's more, again, it's more based on having uh, a less, uh, less lack of confidence in my delivery in my sales pitch or whatever it is with when I'm talking to uh, future teammates, possible future teammates. Yeah. Did you, when you first started, were you, uh, did you just feel like you had to give discounts? You had to, uh, I don't know, sell yourself short a little bit because you didn't have the, the proof behind you like you didn't have a bunch a bunch of like referrals where it's like i've you know i I can show you what i've done like i I feel like businesses like that in general like a lot of businesses have to give away a little bit uh in the initial stages because they have to get those testimonials they have to get people to say yeah this person helped me out this business helped me out did you find yourself doing that a little bit at first yes I, to rewind, is I tried being, or at least my first attempt at being a trainer, I failed miserably, was in 2011 after I got certified. Well, 2010, I went to Salmon, and while I was doing construction, I started training out of JP Fitness in Salmon in Polu. And from then, my at least my just giving you a background was the training side of it. Uh, fast forward to me going into moving to Utah from side one, continuing to train. I went the full time route, did that full time. But again, completely honest is I didn't I failed because I didn't have the accounting backing on it. I didn't have the daily transactions, didn't even have an invoicing process, mm. wasn't tracking the money. Now that's a, it's all types of clusters. Um, immediately so that was my first attempt at it this time around the value of it was both time that time and even this time when i first got into this this time four years ago i was training my nephews i'm training my nieces i was training anyone that wanted to work work out i did free sessions every which way possible with my own family members i did at la fitness i trained at la fitness i picked up people from them i was extremely extroverted which which uh, is what you needed to do. You got to hustle yeah. for any, it doesn't matter what workforce. And was putting myself out there um, and was able to link up with uh, a cool cool trainer at the time, Donnie, at DM Athletics, Matiaki. He's out that way in Kirkland. And we were able to connect and collaborate for a year uh, before going our separate ways. And what was cool was that, again, that experience of training teams, of training private sessions, of uh, it, it didn't matter what time. I love training regardless. Mm. Preference, again, however, was even though I was training out in Kirkland area, uh, in or I currently live in Federal Way in Washington, it's was about an hour. 45 hour from Kirkland. It's an hour away from Kirkland. I was driving up there six days out of the week when at one point for a year. And the athletes that I dealt with over there, they privileged. They're entitled. Mm -hmm. And they showed these things, which again helped solidify my standard once I started to continue to train and run my sessions. I had an idea of what my culture is going to be for athletes based off of those experiences. One of them was I was going to make athletes, all athletes, I'm going to treat them like professional athletes. That learning experience, that L that I took from Utah two years ago was another learning experience of not selling myself short, of not backing down because the one, although, although mentally was a shit show. The biggest switch business-wise 
was knowing that I had a blueprint. Mm. It worked. To act the injuries as he went from constantly having ankle injuries, at least before we started working out, to not having any. Roll an ankle, pop up, nothing. And be able to move in that, in that fashion. Every day of work, I saw the blueprint of what it looks to be a successful basketball player and the balance of skill training and strength and conditioning training. And a third component is to be able to connect the dots. What others call it is game of fire movements, being able to make them more realistic to what your sport is playing. We said that a little bit earlier about what differentiates between athletes. It's those, the connecting of the dots. Mm. And what's really cool, the way I run them, is that although these guys are not hurdlers, I'm teaching them my experience of hurdling. I'm teaching them how to improve that because being able to jump or be able to run over it and being able to do so in a flexible manner, be able to do it with stability and be able not to stumble, having that ankle proprioception, it's, it, it's, it matters. Those proprioceptive glands have to be stimulated to be able to absorb contact as well as absorb it when your foot is striking the ground, jumping, running, running, jumping. It, it matters as far as it to be violent movements. It has to be prepped and primed. And that's the way I've been going about it. Uh, I remember a year ago, roughly, you had a little, you had a little controversy on, uh, you were watching a volleyball game. Remember? Yes. And uh, you posted, uh, I can't remember what you posted, but it was a female volleyballs, vol volleyball players, and you posted something about uh, all of them needed improvement on their athleticism or something like that, and you had some parents get pretty pissed at you. Uh, can you give details about that? And like, what did, first of all, like, how do you feel about the situation? And then like, how did that affect anything going forward? I thought it was funny because it was parents. It was parents that didn't follow the business page. It was parents that or people that, um, it looked like were sent there because how else would they know? How else would they see it? Could you, do you remember what you said exactly? Cause I remember you shared it and it wasn't to me. I was like, I don't even think that's offensive. Yeah, I don't know it why was, uh, it was, I can't quote it exactly, but along the lines of, in my opinion, athleticism, it was, it was something about the athleticism of it and that being uh, the lack of athleticism, the athletic development mm. is the common denominator in all athletes. And I see it a lot in Washington. And that's what I wrote. Yeah. And specifically in Washington. And that comment is based off of my experience of being in multiple states, of being it. Doesn't mean that Washington's any less. It's just because I've been seeing multiple states on these ones and I work with Washington athletes and I'm going to these games and I'm seeing multiple levels of games from college and down, from professional on down. My, in my humble opinion, the development from what I see in the training aspect of it versus how it translates on the court, there's a lack, there's a void of athletic development. These guys, we talked about earlier, the speed development. Yeah, these coaches are just going through the movements, going through the motions. Why are they still hella slow? Why are they not progressing? Why are they not running faster? Why are they not jumping more? Why are they, it, it's, it could be immediately improved, but the interest to learn it, maybe, I don't know. It's a lot of, it's a lot of components of why the trainers, coaches are not doing it, but it's very noticeable, visible when I see it, there's a difference between my athletes. And it's always started with the foundation of them having daily habits for success. It's you have to be able to complete these assessments, daily assessments to work with me. And I truly believe that 
if we build them from the inside out, then they're set up and they're equipped to have these technical skills for their journey towards being a collegiate athlete, and more importantly, beyond. The athletic side of it is just a vehicle. Mm. It's not, by all means, the end of the road. And it's not just get there, I have the goal to get there. It's get there and sustain your success there from what you found in high school, and then you start to move into college. The goal is to win now, or at least to achieve the highest level possible. I got a bomb ass athlete at Penn State, Malia Tooley. Been grinding. She transitioned on to college to Penn State earlier, this, just a few months ago, mm. playing rugby out that way. Shout out to Malia, teammate. It makes sense when they have these habits for success. They're have a voice to express. They have confidence that's built from learned experiences of me being in their ass and giving them consequence sets when they fuck up. It's raising the accountability across the board and not letting them slide on, on it. And then for myself, it's holding them accountable with them. I do the consequence sets with them. I hate it. Mm. My old ass trying to do this shit. <laughs> But it's needed in order for these guys to buy in. It's needed for a culture to be built on, again, effective comms through active accountability. Active accountability means constant. Mm. It means every day. It means they. if I see something, it's an instant check, especially if I'm calling them out, what the fuck, what happened? What, what you need to do this will change this. You've been eating too much carbs. Why are you eating too many pizzas? Why are you, why, what's going on? I thought you wanted a scholarship. Well, because pizza's delicious. That's well, well, I mean, I, yeah, I get it. <laughs> but three days in a row of pizza is, <laughs> <laughs> is not the recipe for student athletes, yeah. unfortunately. It may be for some, like, you know, they got DK Metcalf, this motherfucker eats a whole bunch of candy from what I've heard in his interviews and his Who is this? time at podcasts. DK Metcalf at, for the Seattle Seahawks. Mm, okay. He is a specimen mm. and just doesn't, the nutritional side, at least from what he says, it doesn't, it's not what he follows. We do. We average five meals a day. We average two to three snacks, three to four snacks a day. We average making sure that we improve our fiber. We average protein intake being a priority. We average, Again, we, we attack these things and I'm going about it in a very attentive way of doing it because I know 99% don't do it. I went to the summit, Speed Lab Summit, and me telling some of my processes to, to some of the coaches, bomb ass coaches over there, shout out to Speed Lab, the summit. But no one is holding these guys that accountable. And that's the separation in my program is I want people that I want to work. I want people that I want to build. I want people that want to be gamma fangaluenga or gengi fangaluenga, which means boy or girl worker um, in, in literal translation. But I want someone that's going to match my intensity when we align our goals together. And once you have me, once you have me as your, your trainer, you have me, you have 100% of my effort in everything we're doing. I'm here to work with a few of my athletes and I'm okay with small ones, small sessions to work on development to give these guys a chance to have an interactive training experience instead of one where I'm just telling them, hey, you do this, you do that. And they're, they're, these motherfuckers don't know me. There's only two people, or at least a few of these guys, handful, less than 10, that athletes-wise, they know what the fuck I'm doing. They know how hard I push. Those are the ones that I'm here for. Um, everyone else is just a, a plus, add plus one. But for business reasons, I'm, I'm coming to, I came here to watch some games. I came here to run some sessions. I came here to run pregame and postgame routines, run the recovery session with these guys work on the mental prep, work on what you're going, 
staying with these guys and building with them the mindset, this matters. And this is how I believe every single one of them, 100% of my athletes are gunning for athletic scholarships, athletic and or academic scholarships mm. as student athletes. And we're not going to leave anything to chance. I'm going to help them to create a voice. I'm going to help them take the initiative. I'm going to help them take ownership. I'm going to help them be coachable and not feel poco in any situation. Feel poco is not one word for not coachable, pretty much. A know it all. Yeah. And that's the idea behind what I'm doing. That's my process. When it when it comes to things like uh, the little uproar that you experienced when you criticized, or you I guess it's it's criticism, but it wasn't athletic development is something people can work on. It's not something that they're stuck with. Uh, it's not just you're not saying these people aren't capable. You're just saying they haven't had the work put in. Uh, when you kind of create a little get some backlash for that, you say you think it's funny. Uh, I, I agree, but at the same time, like, how do you let, cause people have to deal with that all the time. People, especially like if they're doing anything where they can face criticism, like criticism is hard for people. How do you let that brush off you? Is it just like looking at the reality of it and being like, these, these people aren't even potential customers. They're not in that league. Uh, how do you like, what is it that makes it easy for you to like brush it off? They can come see me whenever they want. That's how I'm able to brush it off is, again, I'm, in, I'm doing the work. I'm in the trenches. I'm doing the work with these athletes. So I have no, when I, I, when I was in the military, I learned not to give a fuck. Mm. When I was in Bahrain, when I was on USS Ponce and was out there, uh, a year and a half, I learned to not give a fuck about, about what people thought. And that's because of, again, the people I was, do what I was doing and the people around me, um, the missions that we did, the operations. It, I, I was an operations specialist and we are in charge. We were in charge. Or they're currently still in charge, but a OS, an operations specialist, has many, many hats. And they help with a lot of things. It's not tied to one thing. Uh, and one of those things is being able to manage the operations of the ship. It was one of my responsibilities to know where the ship was going, to know the missions of the ship, know who was coming on board, who we're working with, who we're going to do a re replenishment at sea with, the RAS when you pull up next to another ship and you're getting a replenishment of fuel, replenishment of food or any other sources of resources that we don't have replenish. It's a replenishment. Mm -hmm. These experiences are grounding to me. Those experiences are real world. Those experiences of what I've seen um, and not saying so many things, uh, keeping it still general without being specific is the missions that we did the search, the search and seizures, the uh, boarding of other boats, the boarding of other ships uh, without them knowing and being able to, we did uh, a lot of human trafficking operations mm. because piracy is a real thing out in the world. So to me, that's real shit. There's, this is a small bubble that I'm that we're all living in in the U.S. and it tends to get that way if you haven't been outside of the, the country. It tends to get that way when you're not experienced in that sense. Uh, so understandable of the, why people would feel some type of way, but for me, I feel I feel for people, but I don't feel sorry for them. Mm. And this whoever reaches out, these parents that have reached out and expressed their opinion. You can come see me in the gym any fucking time, <laughs> anytime, any trainer, any, it don't matter if it's, if it's a, it's a competition always. And it's out of 
friendly fade type shit. It's, it's looking to compete against the best. I want to be the best trainer I can be. I don't want to be the I don't want to be the best trainer in the world. I want to be the best I can be. And the best that I can do is give my max effort, get my sense of urgency, get my max fucking focus, give those extremes, give it my extreme, extreme effort in each of those categories. And I'll live with the rest. But that's why, again, it's like a bubble on a bubble. I don't I don't pay no mind when people say things. Social media is a is a means of advertisement, promotion, mm. business. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just seems like a really good way to look at it. And yeah, it does seem like people in uh, that have been outside of the country, spent some time outside of the country, understand the world a little bit different. So I like that mindset. Uh, I, I love to ask, do you do you read many books? Like, do you have books that you recommend? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Uh, what, what books do you recommend? Um, well, one of those one that we share, Atomic Habits. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, one that I currently have my athletes reading now in rotation. Um, Donga, by the way, motherfucker. Supposed to give that book up. One of my athletes had it f- for a few weeks. He's supposed to give that to the next athlete. Anyways, that just gave me a reminder because I'm looking at your Tommy Habits right over there. Oh, yeah. But yeah, that's a bomb book. Um, Make Your Bed by Admiral. Forgetting his name. Yeah, we got that book for free at Daily Tribe. <laughs> yeah. They, I, they, 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 that's messed up. I appreciate it, though. That's a, yeah. that's a great book. Yeah, that's a good book. Valuable. Very valuable. Um, There's another one I'm reading that's in my bag right now, but the Hero Code, our Admiral William H. McRaven. Hmm. Yeah. Nice, nice. Same one that made Make Your Bed. Oh, okay, cool, cool. I'll have to check that out. And how about you? Any recommendations? I have so many recommendations, man. Give me, give me top two right now. It depends. Give me you... top two on. Top two on. Time management. Time management. I don't know if I have many on time management that I can think of. I like psychology. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know if I'd be able to, like Atomic Habits would probably be like number one. I just barely finished that, um, too. Mm. Um, It's not time management, but that book right there, Mastery by, by Robert Greene, I, I feel like that's a book anyone who wants to develop in anything and like master anything, uh, that's a book that people should read. The Almanac by Naval Ravikant, uh, that's an amazing book. It's, it's not actually by him, it's, a, it's compiled by somebody, but it's his words and uh, tweets and uh, his you know clips from it. Uh, segments from his interviews and stuff like that. And then, uh, yeah, so none of this is time management, but uh, and another book I'd recommend that I've been reading is uh, Influence by Robert Cialdini. And that's a, an amazing book. Like it, it goes into the psychology of persuasion and why we, uh, why we do certain things and like how we can be influenced in different ways. And I actually, I held a space on it last night where we talked about it. And it was like, we, I focused on the consistency principle, which is like consistency is a good thing in general, but there's like a, a, a trap that people can fall into. Like they did some, uh, he goes over like a, first of all, people were in prison of war camps in, in China and what the Chinese did is they had people compete essay competitions where they would give a small prize. It's like cigarettes or, you know, just little luxuries or anything. It's nothing like huge and substantial. And that plays into uh, the psychology of it. Like if people are doing it for a really big reward, then they won't uh, internalize their reasons for why they're doing something. So 
what they did is they had these uh, prisoners of war compete with essays and they didn't explicitly say like, oh, be anti-American or pro-China in it or pro-communism or anything in it. But they did kind of have a slight bent in favor of people who gave little nods to China or little little knocks to the U.S. And what they found is the people who take part in this, uh, if you say something publicly, even if it's uh, not what you actually believe, you actually adjust your behavior and your personality and your, your belief system to be a little bit more in line with what you said. So it's just interesting how that can influence us. Another example is how, uh, the, I think this was in California. They went in to these houses in California and they said, we want, uh, we want to have you put this billboard up in your yard. And they showed him a picture and it's like this massive billboard that hides the front of their house. So it's like a nice house and then it's completely obstructed by a billboard. Obviously, most people say no to this, but one group of people said yes at a very high rate. And what they found is it was a group that they had gone to earlier, not the same people, but like a different group of researchers or something. Or maybe it wasn't even researchers, but this group of people had uh, said yes to having a very small three inch squared sign that says be a safe driver. So they were both like about driving safely. But this group that said yes to one small like little placard kind of thing in their yard had a much higher tendency of saying yes to a massive billboard that nobody should want. So like saying yes to little things like you want to be consistent with what you have said like so you you just you do like you can when they call for donations and stuff like that like a, a charity what they found is uh asking people how they're doing and waiting for an answer increase the likelihood that they would be charitable because you're, you're asking for money who from people for people who are not doing well so if i ask you like how are you doing today when i call you and and even though you might be having a crappy day like the standard is to be like i'm doing well but how are you here's some people who aren't will you give them money you know and the compliance goes up a lot more with that just because we want to be consistent like oh we said we're doing well i said i'm doing well i can't not help people who aren't doing well so like, that's just the consistency principle in that book. There's so much more. Um, so anyone, like, I feel like it's a valuable book for anyone who wants to, it's a valuable book for anyone, anyone who wants to like influence anything, sales, anything. Like we're all in sales. We're all selling something, you know? So yeah, little rant, rant there, but. No, I like it. Yeah. That's what's up. It sounds it sounds like the consistency of just constantly echoing the same same mindset, whatever it is, whatever the intention is, you're just continuing to Yeah, echo yeah. It. Yeah, and you can get like their sales tactics that people fall for. Like if you if you're at a car sales uh place and they, they're like, Oh, take the car for a day, drive around in it, and then let me know what you think. Like they're getting you to commit to the idea of owning this car and then like the shady tactics they can be like take you through the pro whole process you commit to buying the car at a certain price and then they get to signing the papers and it's like oh it's actually a little bit more it's a little bit more than what i thought right but you already committed to it yeah so like you most people are still going to be like follow through all right like i don't want to spend another thousand dollars but whatever right. I, I want the car right so yeah like this stuff is it's actually pretty crazy to go yeah. into all the research that he does so. yeah well yeah. speaking of um i wanted to gift you this i also have a there's a reminder band of one of the things that we kind of talked about touched i said it went for you damn it nice i feel for you i don't feel sorry for you teammate 
I love it. My athletes, my teammates currently have that earned that. They've earned theirs. And with that being said is hopefully that becomes the reminder to show up to our Sunday session <laughs> at 11 a.m. And pull your weight. I mean, you know, I feel, it's, all right, come on, you know, just... You, you, look, look at the commitment that you just made by putting it on now. <laughs> <laughs> Did that work or what? It might, it might. Yeah. We'll see, we'll see. Uh, speaking of this, I mean, it's red letters. You got your shirt on the F-Way shirt, which is your brand. Uh, and the red has significance. Can you go into that a little bit? Yeah. The red is an acronym for remember everyone deployed. It's a common acronym. I didn't make it up. It's been around, I don't know how long, but I, again, my love for the military branches, my love for people who choose to serve for whatever reasons too. You've already chose to be 1% Tao in that form, in that fashion of volunteering your name for whatever reasons. My, you know, I love these guys. I love it for myself. I, I was someone who just took it extremely serious when I was in and Unfortunately, due to a few experience, normal experiences of the lack of lateral leadership, the politics in the military side of it um, is what ended up being my reason for getting out. But should I have seen the bigger picture, I would have stayed in. Anyways, the red is a constant significance, a constant reminder for myself of who I do this for and my my commitment to my disciplines that's you you meant uh, at least what i mentioned is i've had bomb mass lateral leadership of former coaches and trainers and my father being one of them um my mother being another one of them it's it matters when you have uh, extra motivation or at least uh, an intention behind what we do and my intentions with my business is to rebuild, again, the target audiences that I'm working with, people that look like me, people, and I'm not just talking about the physical sense of it, of being someone and being a minority, but also that have this work ethic. And you may not know it, people, majority of the time, 100% 100 of the time, when I meet someone, they wanted the bare minimum of what the program offers. Mm -hmm. They wanted just, uh, let me get that, uh, 14 week program, I was, let me go grab that. Let me just tell me what to write, what to do, what number of sets, fuck that. What this program comes with is my personal touch on it. What this continues to build off of is my investment in you through my decision-making as your lateral leadership, your extended. And that's what I do with the families that I'm working with. I love, I have professional athletes, I've, have college athletes, um, and I think social media, from what some of my close people have told me, was it looks like it's always geared towards the athletes. And that's because that's my passion. I, I love to train, I love doing what I'm doing. I love working with the people that I have. I wish I had more military folks that were interested in building through the balance and stability side of it. Uh, and I'm soon to put all my library, movement library and mindset assessments out there online um, within the next three months, um, fine tuning it and it's never perfect. I've been working on it religiously, but I wanna get back to, I wanna build military communities that have lacked in fitness. I wanna build Samoan, Polynesian, Tongan, Fijian, Dominican, Puerto Rican, um, all those who've been touched by obesity, all those motherfuckers who've gotten complacent. Mm. Like I'm comfortable and I want to work with other people. They don't even have to be minorities. I have other, I got some white athletes. I got all, all of them. I got all different types. And what I continue to tell them is what I'm telling you now, Art, is if you have the same drive to make it as a student athlete or in the athletic side, and you want to work in an extremely hard way of getting there with taking zero shortcuts, then this program is for you. If it's not, if there's any question in your sense of urgency, your focus or your effort, 
It is not for you. It's a waste of money, a waste of time. It's a waste of money on the parents' part. It's a waste of money on whoever's funding this. And it's a waste of time on my end of investing in you where I want to direct this energy to succeed through daily habits. And through all the, all the resources that come along with networking with me, I want to build through a mindset and movement progressive program. Mm. Holy. Uh, it's been awesome talking to you today, man. Uh, before we wrap up, I just want to hand it over to you to tell people where they can find you, like your social media, uh, where they can follow you, where they can uh, find your website to book uh, time with you, anything like that, anything you want to share. Yeah. Website is www.fonotiway.us. And what, what else you say? For- Email. Social media, yeah, anything social you media, share. Phono T way, Phono T underscore way, I believe. Phono T way is on Instagram. Um, I'm also on TikTok and Facebook, but to be completely honest, that's too much. Social media is too much. The business side of this shit, I don't know how entrepreneurs do it, but I, I stay mainly on IG. And even on that, I keep all my notifications off so I can lock in on the development side of it, on the primary at least the priorities of training development and then the multiple fucking hats that you wear with the entrepreneurship this shit is not for the week yeah so instagram you can find me on there um and yeah the website but again this is not for everyone yeah this way of accountability this way of communication is not for everyone when Molly Lava, please be coachable and I want to feel poco because it's it again, it goes. There's so many people that are going to make sacrifices to make this work, and you want to build with those who have the same intentions or at least the same like minded goals of pushing it. That's where I realign. And again, I've let go of some solid people over just the last year, trim my numbers down for the sake of maintaining my culture. Awesome. Thank you, Art. Cool. It's been great, man. Man, thank you for having me. I really appreciate you, bro. Thank yeah. you again for this time. And just uh, extremely grateful to be here um, showcasing this. I was hella nervous, <laughs> by the way. I, you know how fucking nervous I was. The first time we tried to do this it was at Starbucks. Yeah. The mic, shitty ass laptop mic, this was before I got the Mac, and was not working, didn't to account for all the producing shit that would go into making this a successful audio yeah. outlet. But in the meantime, between then, I've spoken at two things ahead of, ahead of this so I could be prepared to have this conversation and not, not be uncomfortable because yeah. my confidence in communication to me has been the biggest growth overall but again appreciate you art yeah i appreciate you man thank you thank you for listening to this episode of thoughtfully mindless if our conversations resonate with you consider leaving a five-star review on apple and spotify it goes a long way in helping the show grow and reach more listeners if you'd like to support the show you can go to thoughtfullymindless.com under the support tab where you can find my amazon affiliate store where i have brands that i personally use and fractalzoo.net, which is where I have unique fractal-inspired t-shirts that I design. You can find me on social media on x at rdtm podcast and Instagram at thoughtfully mindless. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Until next time, stay thoughtfully mindless. <laughs>